guess would be the way I'd want to put it. Okay, so uh, these are just some final notes here, basically the same, as I just th same things I just said. And I just want to show you these figures, which is the classic figure from a famous, um, uh, the, the person who founded the field of cladistics and sort of founded phylogenetic systematics, which is Willy Hennig, a German, who in 1966 published this famous book. And it's a report even, even then where he was getting very deep into the philosophy of divergence and how we represent species on, on trees. And many of our ideas have changed since then. But even then, he was focused on this simple thing. It's important to remember that a simple branching diagram represents a series of populations in that diver slowly diverging clade that I talked about earlier. We see it on a tree representing something like this as just a fork in a phylogeny. But that fork is really a series of metapopulations, of populations that are interacting with each other up to a point and then that, that interaction stops. And so uh, Hennig recognized a, a series of different types of relationships among organisms. First, he recognized what he called ontogenetic relationships, which is the, the relationships between the uh, juvenile or the, um, the, the newborn form of that, species, that, that individual and the adult, the ontogenetic relation, relationships among those individuals across time. He recognized the tocogenetic relationships, and those are the relationships shown here by the arrows of the individuals that are interacting in the same population, in that same lineage, which is a series of ancestor descendant populations through time. And these are the populations, this level's one, this level's one, this level is one. And these individuals are all interacting in a, for, in a form by exchanging genes, just like members of a family. And the next generation, your children will, um, the relationships between you and your children, that genetic relationship, is what's represented by these, brand, these arrows on the tree. And then here is the point where something happens, a river shifts or allopatry occurs, meaning that, that the populations begin to diverge. And one lineage goes this way, and one lineage goes that way, and we, re we think of it as speciation, but we want to remember the two things that I really want to emphasize from today. It's a process, it's not an event. It's something that takes time, and that divergence happens through time. And then also, we want to remember that this picture will show you the, the final point, was that here's the phylogeny, and this is the phylogeny that we'll see and we'll talk about for the rest of today when we talk about how we might interpret classification systems with respect to a branching diagram. This is the phylogeny, but always remember that these branches, these lineages, are really populations through time. Here's one level, here's one generation, here's another, here's another, here's another. These are all lineage segments, and the lineages are, you can think of them as a series of, just what I've shown here, ancestor, descendant, series of populations through time that, re, that maintain their cohesion, they all they maintain and, re, and represent a unified thing through time that's different, that's distinct, and that's different with respect to other such lineages. So these things, D and E, are separate species because they have, each of them has this whole population contained within that branch and within that branch and they're distinct from each other because at this point they became distinct and stopped sharing genetic material and became distinct and separate lineages, series of ancestral descendant populations that are distinct from each other and cohesive through, it, through time. And that time we can think of as ancestor descendant series of populations. Okay, that's where I'll stop and I'm gonna show you, actually, before I go on, um, do we have time before lunch to talk about some real examples of frogs? Yes. Okay, uh, well I show you some real world examples with phylogenies. I just, we'll just stop for a second. Does anyone have any questions about this highly technical and pretty dry and sometimes boring and confusing terminology and definitions? No? You all got it? Okay. Well, um, let's, if you do develop questions over the next couple of days, of, oh, we do have one back here, yeah. And I, was, I guess before I go over, I was gonna say, if you do develop questions over the course of the, um, over the series of the course over the next couple days, um, feel free to stop me and we can go back over one-on-one, -on -one, go back over the lecture and, um, and talk about any of the definitions and I can try to re-explain it in different ways. It took me a long time as a student to, to grasp this stuff, um, but when you do, then you can talk to other systematists and speak the same language, so that's really important. Yes, sir. The issue of uh, Polyphyletic, yeah. Polyphyletic, I'm asking. I want to ask what would be the situation where they, before they would consider um, organism. What would be the, so in the, in the case of a polyphyletic, yes. polyphyletic taxon, yes. what would be the, I'm sorry, I didn't what quite understand. What characters would it be considering? Because it's like 
you were talking of that organism having the same gene gen genetic mm -hmm. names. Mm -hmm. Because I don't understand why should we group them. So okay, rather than to just say okay, they should form different genes. Right. I think I understand. Um, so how does that how does that work with respect to characters, right? Yes. Types of data. So what we know is from the phylogeny, and let's just say that we assume that that's the true evolutionary relationships. We know that those things do not share a close ancestor or, or don't share a more recent ancestor with respect to everything else in the tree. So we refer to them as polyphyletic. So what kind of characters might the taxonomists use to, to think that they're the same thing, right? And that might have been any kind of character, like morphology or color pattern or anything that a taxonomist would use to try to infer a relationship. So let's just say if those were the case of birds, those might have been birds of the same size that have the same color. And so, it, and this happens all the time. The taxonomists look at them and think, well, they have these same suites of characters. This one's red and this one's red and they're the same size. And everything else in, the, in that tree is yellow. So I'm gonna take the red ones and put them together. And, um, and in that case, uh, those characters, the morphology, the color pattern, sort of mislead the taxonomist who then puts them in the same genus, and that would be a polyphyletic genus if they don't have a most recent common ancestor. So that's a really good question, because it happens all the time. It's really, really common. I'm gonna show you some examples of where that's happened a lot in groups of organisms that are really diverse right here in Cameroon. Um, so uh, and in that case, we might say, uh, in the, I guess the final answer with respect to your question, what kind of characters are those? The red coloration that made a, taxon a taxonomist assemble a polyphyletic genus um, those characters would be convergent characters. We would say that that red coloration has convergently evolved the same color, even though those are not the same, the closest relatives. So different types of character states can be misleading. And uh, there's, I guess, the rule of thumb that I like to stick with is no type of character is better than any other type of character, unless, um, and, you know, coloration, morphology, osteology, bones, external morphology, um, those are all, all types of characters that we can perceive as humans are characters that can be convergent and, misle and mislead us if they're not tracking phylogeny perfectly. Other questions? One over here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. During a systematic, when can we really conclude that the two taxa are different? During in systematics, when at what point do we make an inference of that two taxa are really different? That's a gr that's a great question, and that that figure I showed that showed the different levels of of divergence. Um, that that character. Let me see if I can get back to it. Can I do it from here? Nope. Yes, not. Wait a minute. I'm going to go over here and try to answer your question here. When can we tell? Do I understand this right? When can we tell that two species are really different and have diverged into separate species? That's the question of a uh, million dollar question. That's a question that pe more people have argued about than, than, uh, than almost everything else in speciation stuff. And I guess the point that um, our colleague Kevin Decay Rose tried to emphasize in this figure was that um, we should be, in the back of our minds, remembering this, that populations begin to diverge, and then they do actually diverge and become separate lineages and become separate species, but the point at which we recognize them as separate species is kind of arbitrary, and depending on what, what we're focused on. Are we focused, are we focused on morphology, or color pattern, or ecological differences, or any of the or genetic differences? That, that point at which you know, we might not, some people might not recognize these two separate evolutionary lineages as distinct species until this point, way deep, uh, way high in the tree, when they're really different colors. This one's white and this one's black. And this person, the taxonomist might say, ah, finally, those things are really different. The color pattern is different. One's white, one's black. But then if you went back in time, you'd see the point at which this one becomes less white and less white is more gray and this one becomes more and more light. And at some point back in time, they blend back into each other if you go back in time. And that difference, that, we, that thing that we call a difference as biologists artificially trying to judge diversity, that difference is really arbitrary and artificial. It's based on our perception. Um, and so 
there isn't really a right answer to that. So it's the best thing for us to do is to remember this process right here, right, where populations begin to diverge, and eventually they do diverge, and then hopefully we use methods that detect that as soon as possible and detect that divergence and that separation of lineages. But you know, by no means can we claim to be perfect, and by no means can we claim that one character is better than any other type of character for answering that question. So there's kind of no correct answer. Would you, Dave, would you, do you have anything to add? Maybe just a, uh, an example to drive that home is that the, the traits that you use to tell species apart, say for a given species of plant, those are not necessarily the important differences that separate those two plant species from one another, right? Right. It may be that you can tell them apart because, you know, they have slightly more spines on the stem or something. But it may be that biologically the reason they can't, you know, reproduce with one another has something more to do with the way in which, you know, the pollen, the way in which the gametes interact, right? It really doesn't have anything to do with thorns. That's not why they're not interbreeding and creating a single species, right? right? There's other traits that are there that we just can't perceive mm -hmm. that are the traits that are really related to keeping these biologically as two separate species that are not hybridizing, they're not interbreeding, right? Right. But we're, we're <coughs> using sort of like surrogates, right? We're just using whatever we can see as part of the toolkit for telling these different things apart from one another. Exactly. That's not necessarily the biology behind why they're actually you know, kept apart in nature and not hybridizing with one another. I think that's great. Yeah, I think the, the quick answer to that is even if we can't tell them apart, sometimes they can tell each other apart. Right. It doesn't matter what, how we see them. It's no matter how they, whether they see each other as separate species. Right, right. Yeah.